my theory is that the uh, uh, ship went flat and turned over the stern and sunk. But according to the people we rescued, it, it was sunk in two minutes. While the Dutch captain Karsten Bona is an important witness, we must be careful to trust his version of events too explicitly. According to Euronews, it was Borna who first suggested the Bayesian's huge mass broke and that this then damaged the hull, causing the massive superyacht to sink super quickly. According to the article, the first hypothesis that was circulated was that the mast had broken based on what was reported by the captain of the ship that brought the 15 rescued passengers to safety. In this scenario, the mast breakage would have caused damage to the hull and resulted in the boat becoming unbalanced, tilting to one side and then sinking. And isn't that how many of us have thought about it? Tilted to one side and then sank and then ended up on the ocean floor the way that we've seen it. So it started in that position, ended in that position. A source briefed on the investigation told Corriere della Sera that divers who went down to inspect the wreck found the mast in one piece with the boat intact, its hull unbreached, its hatches closed, its windows in place. I got nightmares in my head, I fear the spirit of the dead, I can't My mind fills up into a creature and it haunts me somewhere much deeper. I got nightmares in my head, I fear Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. On paper, the Bayesian, like the Titanic, ought to have been the best, the safest craft to ride out the disaster. From the Guardian, Gabriel Bruni, a sailor who has twice participated in the America's Cup and has coached the Italian Olympic team, said, If they had asked me that night, on a stormy day, in which sailboat in the world I would have wanted to be, I would have chosen the Bayesian. So why was the Bayesian, like the Titanic, the worst boat to be in in an emergency? I do think size and extravagance have a lot to do with it. In this analysis, we're going to deal with the design, but more particularly the correct way, certainly in my opinion, to think about this tragedy And I think that is where a lot of the problem in terms of this whole thing is is coming from why people are struggling to figure it out, is they're stuck in patterns of thinking. And I've noticed a lot of people saying, I've got 40 years of experience, I've got so much experience as a yachtsman, I know exactly what happened here, you don't know anything. Well, that is another example of being stuck in a pattern of thinking. Obviously, as someone coming in from the true crime thing, I don't have any horse in the race. I'm not siding with the manufacturer, the crew, the victims, the vessel, any of those. I'm just trying to figure out what happened here. And we'll see whether that is of benefit to figuring out the the, um, truth of the matter in an um, unbiased way. Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Welcome to the many of you who have subscribed. I've obviously covered the Titan Submersible in great detail. So if you find this analysis worthwhile, go and have a look at that. I'll put a link to the playlist in the description. If you find this analysis worthwhile, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. Think about it, size and extravagance are what the Bayesian and the Titanic have in common. But I also think the psychology around size and extravagance and wealth and prestige is worth looking at. Now, I can't claim to be an expert in accident reconstruction, especially when it comes to boats. However, I do think there is a scientifically sensible way to be thinking about it. Although it seems intuitive to imagine because the Bayesian was found on, the, on its right side, the starboard side, that that's how it sank, to take the sort of finish line and then the finish line of the, the, the boat sinking and to then uh, reverse engineer that to the starting line to say, well, that's how it started to sink. You know, it got blown over, it got blown onto its right side, and then it sank, right? Wrong. And I've seen several yacht experts and sailors focused on this aspect. 
also known as the angle of vanishing stability. This focus on the lateral forces and angles, also known as the angle of lull, seems to make sense given how we think sailboats work and given the position of the yacht when it was found, but I would wager it's entirely irrelevant to how Bayesian found it. Over the past few days I've seen some depictions and descriptions of the way this craft sank that are at turns contradictory or otherwise flat out wrong. Like this one. In Superyacht Times, the theory was predictably the same. Quote, Witnesses reported that Bayesian was anchored a few hundred meters from Porticello when a water spout struck. The force of the storm and winds may have caused the yacht to be tipped over. Those words need to be emphasized. Tipped over, leaving her deck below the surface and making it difficult to rebalance her. So it's interesting to me how expert yachtsmen have all defaulted to the same intuitive narrative, and yet the reality here seems to be counterintuitive. Now, I've been using the one maritime disaster I know pretty well, Titanic, to compare to this one. And one might say they are completely different vessels, and it's a completely different situation. And I can see how there is some truth in that. But there is also truth in the fact that both the Bayesian and the Titanic share similar psychologies, extravagance, prestige, oversized luxury, and hubris. And so one has to wonder what is more decisively compelling and significant here, psychological cogency, which has to do with human nature, or just the anemic cogency of sailing vessels in and of themselves, which has to do with the nature of sailing vessels. I also think the Titanic provides useful allegory for simply thinking in general terms about how a, a ship sinks. You know, beyond the psychology, think about the dynamics involved. I mean, when a ship fills with water and sinks, just how that process plays out. The Titanic, you may recall, suffered damage to the starboard side, and yet it remained upright. It didn't turn onto its starboard side and sink, and indeed, even the wreck on the ocean floor which is really a, a long way beneath the surface where it struck the iceberg, well, it is still upright as well, although unlike the Bayesian, far from intact. In terms of the Bayesian, I've found three different versions for how it sank in the media. Bow first, stern first, and that it sank while turned on its side. So what really happened? This man, 36-year-old Fabio Safalu, a local fisherman said he saw the whole thing. He arrived at the port at 3.30 a.m. and he saw flashes of lightning illuminating the sky. Quoting from The Guardian, At 3.55 a sort of mini tornado arrived, Safalu said. I have seen many storms in my life, but I had never seen anything like this. I saw the wind sweep the chairs and tables of the bar, heading towards the boats in the harbor. The docks diverted the whirlwind, which went straight towards the yacht. Now, what's incredible is that one assumes the crew on the one vessel were alert and prepared and awake, while those on the other vessel weren't. Isn't that how you thought about it? But now that turns out to be not true either. The captain of the Sir Baden Powell was also awakened by the storm. We were awakened by the storm, Karsten told the Guardian. The first thing I did was start the engines on my sailboat to give more stability to the vessel, after securing our boat, we immediately approached the Bayesian. And so we can rightly ask if the one captain was able to take decisive action, action that turned out to be effective, and they were essentially facing similar weather, why couldn't, why didn't the other captain? It may be that a water spout struck the one vessel and not the other, and so the one bore the brunt of a sudden, a sudden weather situation perhaps full on, while the other did not. Moreover, water spouts typically snap sailboat masts and yet the Bayesian's mast is intact along with the rest of the craft. According to Euro News, quote, On Monday morning a group of fishermen in Porticello said they saw a water spout that lasted about 12 minutes. The greatest risk a ship faces when hit by a water spout is that its mast will break. And yet we seem to have a witness, our fisherman friend Fabio, who says he actually saw the tornado form on land and then head out to sea to the yachts. 
Except if we take our cue from the investigators, the prosecutors, the issue here isn't a water spout, but a downdraft. I've never seen a vessel of this size go down so quickly, said Borna. Within a few minutes, there was nothing left. Then we saw the raft with the 15 passengers. It was a tragedy. Now, of course, Borna also passed on what the survivor said to him, that the craft went down in two minutes, which I just don't think is accurate. So him saying that he might be accurately passing on what he's heard, but that might not be accurate in the first place. Now, I suppose one could say the same about Titanic. If you think about it, Titanic sank pretty quickly as well. I think something like two and a half hours or something. For a vessel of that size, that is pretty pretty fast. Now, it may seem an obvious enough statement, but we ought to make it anyway. Had it sank more slowly, far more would have survived, and possibly even everyone. And the same applies to the superyacht. This prompts us to ask again, how did it sink and why did it sink so quickly? According to Euronews, experts are baffled by how the Bayesian sank so quickly. Italian media, speaking with Coast Guard sources, reported that a hatch allegedly remained open and that the keel was partially raised. Some experts speculate that the crew may have underestimated the weather bulletin. According to FT.com, quote, investigators found the boat sank stern first, not bow first. That's according to Ambrosio Cartosio, Italian public prosecutor. And now the number one clue we all missed. Stern first is the opposite way to which the Titanic sank. Titanic sank with its arse in the air. Titanic sank bow first. Why? Because the bow side filled with water first. The bow side became heavier and then simply sank nose first, like this. Unlike Titanic, the Bayesian sank with its nose in the air. And so in this case, the rear, the stern of the superyacht filled with water and then steadily the ship went vertical. A little like this. Or like this. But not like this. And not like this. Or this. The discovery followed analysis of the position of the vessel on the seabed, interviews with survivors and the testimony of skipper Karsten Borner, whose yacht was anchored near Bayesian when the storm hit. So even though they spoke to the captain, seems the prosecutor came to a different assessment. Even though they spoke to witnesses who saw the water spout, the prosecutor still thought, we think this is more to do with a downdraft than the actual tornado. We know that the engine room, number two in the graphic, was situated more on the stern side, that's the rear side, so the stern flooding would explain why the yacht lost power and ended up dead in the water. It should also be noted that the two major hull hatches are both situated on the rear as well, the stern side, including the swimming platform and the tender garage. If the stern side sank first, then there was less time for the important guests to get to safety and more time for the crew to respond. Now, if you, Again, if you look at the graphic, you can see where on the craft the, um, the guests would have stayed, which is more on the stern side, and where the crew were situated, which is more on the bow side. So obviously the side that would start sinking first would give those people less time to respond. And so which side has less time to respond? The stern side, the guest side. And that's the side where most of the casualties are. It also explains why so many of those who drowned were found in the crew quarters. Think about Jack and Rose and everyone on Titanic. They're trying to evade the inexorably rising water. One can also imagine once the vessel went vertical, how difficult it would be to navigate out through the usual exits. Again, as soon as the craft turns vertical, you've got to think about the craft in a totally different way, which is quite difficult to do. Bayesian, the fairy tale idea of the ship like Titanic, lingers even after it sank. And so do you see, in the same way people can't imagine the ship sinking because they are so attached to a fairy tale of luxurious extravagance, even after the ship has sunk, they still can't let go of the fairy tale and still can't imagine what really happened. 
All they can imagine is an iceberg or a water spout, but they can't seem to imagine human error or flaws in design, again, because we are so attached to fairy tales of preeminence. In this sense, the Bayesian really is a profoundly Shakespearean tragedy, a story of struggle and triumph, but ultimately calamity, where the fates interfere with human endeavor and, at a given moment, at an unexpected moment, the fates effortlessly and supernaturally sweep in to overwhelm the tragic hero and his mighty magic ship, just as we saw with the Titanic. The reality, though, is if we weren't so preoccupied with fairy tales, we'd be prepared for the fates, and we'd call them for what they are. Not fate, but life. Right, I'm not going to take it further than that. Uh, I will be doing a live stream dealing with the uh, crime news updates. I didn't do it yesterday because of Labor Day. I'll also be discussing the super yacht and how it founded during that discussion, so I hope you'll join me for that. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.